Um, now, Biden has been presented as the sensible centrist. Uh, you know, very different to the Democrats, socialist squad, and all the all the lunatics who have infiltrated the party. But he has also wholeheartedly embraced identity politics and really radical ideas like supporting children under ten transitioning. So, how much of a centrist is Joe Biden in 2020? Well, I don't think Joe Biden knows what he is in 2020, and that really is the danger. <laughs> Joe Biden is 78 years old. It's fairly obvious to everyone that he has a significant level of cognitive decline. He has trouble reading off a teleprompter, and when he's not on the teleprompter, he muddles his words. He can't really speak. He loses his train of thought and the rest of it. I don't know what they did during the debates to keep him on point, but they, they definitely did something. I don't know if it was from hiding in the bunker for a week beforehand, and then they just threw him out there and he, he did his thing. Um, but the idea, I, I heard a lot of this from my more centrist friends that were generally thought of as lefties or liberals. A lot of them said, see, the Democrats didn't go completely bananas. They didn't choose Bernie Sanders. They didn't choose Elizabeth Warren. They went with the old Joe Biden, and he's going to, you know, govern basically as a centrist Democrat. Except it's it's very obvious in the 30-plus days since he was elected, which I'm still not quite sure he's going to be the president even. Uh, but it's it's become very obvious in these 30 days with the picks, with the messaging coming out, that he is going to govern as a radical leftist. They are going to get critical race theory back in the schools. Uh, they are going to be teaching the 1619 project. They are going to get rid of title. Uh, they're going to put mm. Title IX back in the colleges, which will remove due process. All of the things that you know, were thought of as scary Trump things that in many ways were saving liberalism, saving our institutions, they're all on their way to being destroyed with the Biden administration. And I, truly, I don't think he's in charge. I don't know who's in charge, but if you're, if you're walking around thinking that this 78-year-old guy with a broken foot who's, you know, can't really speak, who's coughing constantly, if you think he's in charge, I got a bridge to sell you. I'm still bewildered by how he broke his foot. The official story seems to be now that he got out of the shower and chased his dog's... No, no, he got out of the shower and tried to pull his dog's pull. tail and, and fell. I mean, that is just not... <laughs> Who do does that? that? Um, oh, goodness. But do you think we are going to have a Madam President, Kamala Harris, in our future, maybe <laughs> in the near future? Yeah, well, look, going on the assumption that Biden does get sworn in on the 20th, with, which, again, I'm not totally sure is going to happen, but let's just say that that happens and that's sort of conventional wisdom at this point. Um, I, I would be shocked if the guy lasts a year. I, I would bet almost everything he doesn't last the full term. And they knew that. They knew that going in. And, and what I always said about this for the last year is that the scandal was the non-scandal. Everyone knows something's not right with Joe Biden. Everyone knows it. I don't take any great pleasure in that. My, my grandmother uh, had dementia in her later years, and I spent a lot of time with her. And it, it's not fun. It's, it's pretty horrific. So I don't mean to be glib about it. But the scandal is that the media decided we can't talk about it, while everyone knows something is wrong. So if you take his age, if you take the broken foot, if you take the fact that he's giving speeches and coughing in his hand constantly, which we're told not to do, and all of those things, and the fact that before the election, let's not forget, Nancy Pelosi, the leader of the House, was talking about using the 25th Amendment, which would basically be their way of smuggling Kamala Harris. Harrison. I think it's fairly obvious that if Biden begins it, the term January 20th, 2021, it will be Kamala Harris by the end of it. And Kamala's voting record is amongst the most radically left wing of, of anybody. So you go from a supposed uh, centrist in Biden to a, uh, a very different presidency if it's under Harris. Now, in 2020, and, and we saw Rita, BLM's... Rita, quickly, by the way, Rita, by the way uh, Kamala Harris dropped out of the Democratic presidential primary very <laughs> early on, even though people thought she was going to be a front runner, and she was basically polling at zero. So in effect, if what we're talking about here happens, the president of the United States will be someone who dropped out of their own primary early and then polled at zero. I mean, really think about how, how twisted that could become. 
Oh, absolutely. And she had such glowing media coverage. And yeah, you're right. And she she just did horribly um, and got absolutely destroyed by, by Tulsi, who would have been a good vice right. president. But I digress. Now, we've seen in 2020 um, the influence of Black Lives Matter really increase. The corporate support for the, for the group has soared to new heights. Uh, what has that done for race relations in the U.S.? You know, the real truth of it is if, if you remove this small sliver of people who are constantly in the race trade, who are grifting on race, the average American, no matter what you're seeing on TV, Americans love the idea that we're this great pluralistic society. America has done a better job than any country in the history of the world for roughly 250 years bringing people from all walks of life together. You can bring your foods, your traditions, your religions, your all of the all of the stuff that makes you you and then what you do is you fold that into America. That's why we're a melting pot which in many ways most of Europe wasn't able to do. Europe in many ways is much more ghettoized between ethnic communities. We've done it so brilliantly here, so spectacularly, and we fought a war to end slavery within about 100 years of our founding. That's pretty good. It doesn't mean our history is perfect, mm. but it means that it's pretty good. The only racists in America today are not what the media will tell you, which is that there's these far right racists running around in the KKK and the Ku Klux Klan. Nobody knows where they are. I'm not, to, that's not saying that there are literally none of them. Of course, there are some actual racists, but the racists of today are the people who purport to be the anti-racists, the people who are mm. obsessed with skin color, the people who say, oh, you should get this job because of your skin color. You should get this job because of your gender or your sexuality. So in terms of re race relations in reality, the average person is not racist and we are, we're a highly functional good society. There is a sliver of very influential radical leftists who have somehow infected the, the academic level, meaning the colleges, they've affected the, the political mm. level, meaning virtually all of the Democratic Party, and then they've really affected our mainstream media, which is just an absolute clown show, and they, they push this <laughs> idea on us, but, but most people are not racist. By the way, most people in your country aren't racist either, and it was one of my favorite places to Absolutely. visit when I, was, when I was on tour, yeah. And, but we've got the same phenomenon with, with elements of the media and certainly academia and, and popular culture who are desperate to, to, to present Australia as inherently racist. Uh, lastly, Dave, you were one of the very first people to recognise the dangers of big tech uh, suppressing and censoring stories, people and even ideas they don't like. Uh, will the likes of Google, Twitter and Facebook face a reckoning at some point in the future? Well, look, uh, David beat Goliath, so, you know, I always say maybe maybe <laughs> Dave here can beat Google. I, I always think there's a chance. However, again, if we're to believe that Biden is going to be sworn in uh, come January, I think at that point big tech is going to do things that we can't even imagine. The levels of censorship, if, you know, you've been talking about this for a long time too, Rita, and, and the levels of censorship mm -hmm. that we've seen on Twitter, that we see on YouTube, algorithmic tricks, deboosting, shadow banning, the litany of ways that they manipulate us. Uh, just as we're talking today, I just saw in the last hour, you know, two weeks before the election, Twitter changed the way you can retweet, which made it harder to yeah. amplify certain messages. They did that two weeks before the election. They didn't announce that they were doing it. They just said, okay, here we go. We're doing it. And then today they reversed it. Well, what could have happened in the last <laughs> month that maybe would mm. make them do something strange <laughs> to manipulate information and now it's okay? So I think that the only thing that was keeping them slightly in check was Trump, was the idea that, oh, he might actually move on some executive actions and, and do some stuff with Section 230 of the Communications Act and a bunch of other stuff. But in effect, if they have their guy in office, Biden, at that point, why wouldn't Twitter get rid of the scary Republicans, the right-wingers, the, the anti-lockdown people, of which I absolutely include myself? I mean, why wouldn't you just eliminate all of the people you deem bad? And I think we're in for a world of hurt after uh, January 20th, if Biden is put in. Good goodness me, that's some scary stuff. Dave Rubin, thank you so much for joining us on Inside the News. My pleasure, Rita.